Judge not before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Words taken from our epistle today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we will consider the danger of presumption. Now, you might ask, why today? Why the fourth Sunday of Advent, with Christmas literally right around the corner? Advent, as you know, is a time of both penance and joy, a time for both fear and hope. Hope in the coming of the merciful Savior, but also fear, fear that we may have at times abused God's mercy. Now, hopefully, your Advent has had a measure of penance to it, of abstinence, of greater time for prayer and reflection. Before we rush headlong into the Christmas feasts and the dangers that sometimes accompany them, let us reinforce our resolve not to fall back into sin, particularly not back into any habits we may have had, especially if they are habits of grave sin. So we must have both fear and hope. If despair is fear without hope, then presumption is hope without fear. The Catholic Encyclopedia well defines it. Presumption is the condition of a soul which, because of a badly regulated reliance on God's mercy and power, hopes for salvation without doing anything to deserve it or for pardon of his sins without repenting of them. Now, strictly speaking, presumption is a sin of belief, the belief that God will forgive you even if you aren't even sorry, or as the true presumptives might say, God is too good to send anyone to hell, and so I can do whatever I want. Now, they're probably not here. What then, we might ask, of the sinner who, even as he willingly commits some mortal sin, has an intention to seek forgiveness for it at some later time? Yes, St. Thomas teaches such a one is not strictly guilty of presumption against God, because he still believes that he must seek and receive forgiveness for his sin. But does he not presume in other ways? He presumes both upon himself and upon reality. He presumes that, willing, freely choosing to commit some grave sin once, twice, or however many times, at some point he will change his mind and suddenly believe that what seems so good to him now is really evil and should be repented of. I will repent of this tomorrow, you say. But tomorrow you is not here. The only you who is here is the one who thinks this is good to do. I already committed this sin once this week and must go to confession. Why not commit it a few more times after that? In for a penny, in for a pound. Cannot God as easily forgive two sins as one, or ten sins as five? See how such presumption increases sin. And how long will you act in this way? How long will you act as if this thing was good before you start to believe it? You felt great guilt the first time, but after the second, the third, that feeling starts to diminish. At some point, rather than quit the sin, you will simply quit feeling bad about it. So much for what lies under our control, our own will. This sinner also presumes upon realities far outside of his own control. Tomorrow, he says, I will repent. I will go to confession on Sunday, if the line permits me. 
And if not, the next Sunday then. Who promised you tomorrow? Who promised you Sunday? Who promised you the chance to go to confession? And if this is your thinking, again, how can you be sure that you are truly sorry for your sins in confession when you make such calculations upon the mercy of God? If your friend said a rude thing to you, but before going to apologize, decided to detract you and punch you in the face, and to do so for several weeks, so that his apology might cover more, why would you believe him when he finally got around to giving it to you? If someone says, I don't mean to be rude, but do you have any doubt that he fully intends to say some rude thing, trying to apologize in advance? Does he not presume upon your forgiveness in the very act of insulting you? One who has contracted a habit of grave sin is even more open to presumption. For when he leaves the confessional, will he apply the remedy for such a habit? Will he exercise himself rigorously so that he removes all occasions of that sin and does all in his power to avoid that sin in the future? Or does he say a few Hail Marys and then just presume that this habit that he has built up over time, over years perhaps, will just vanish? He thinks, well, if I fall into sin again, I can always just go back to confession. He believes, perhaps only in the back of his mind, that he walks the tightrope above the safety net, that he need not be very careful. After all, the safety net will always catch him. He can always go back to confession and then keep on living carelessly. Thus, in effect, he presumes that God will always have mercy on him, even if he has little intention to do what he must to avoid sin in the future. He may feel regret for the sin in the confessional and desire not to commit it again, but only if it's not too much trouble. Is he not just a presumptive in practice? I do want to stop for a moment and remind you that in all of this, we're speaking of is mortal sins, specifically. But what we say of mortal sin can be said in an analogous way of intentional venial sins, especially any habits of such. Now, yes, again, these sins will not of themselves rob us of heaven. But just as habitual, accumulated venial sins make it easier for us to fall into mortal sin, so does those little presumptions, in that regard even, lay the groundwork for us to commit graver presumptions. Set your mind at ease. Oh, thank you. Um, We cannot say, or at least we ought not to say, um, any of this is applied to sins of weakness, those venial sins of weakness, uh, sins committed with hardly any forethought, which we may indeed find ourselves confessing over and over again. Presumption only applies to those sins that we commit knowing beforehand that this is something sinful, but I'm resolving to do it anyway, believing that mercy is one with little or no repentance on my part. This is too frightening, you say. It is. Am I not myself frightened at such a sight? I am. Even if this applies to no one here, and we hope that it doesn't, are we not all capable of contracting such habits? Do we not all know others who may have done so? And how do we show charity for them? Do we offer them kind, reassuring words as they throw themselves back in again and again, not seeing the grave danger they're in? Do we warn them? 
Do you wish a second opinion? I do not blame you. This is a hard saying. Listen then to St. Alphonsus Liguri, the great doctor of moral theology, in a sermon on the number of sins beyond which God pardons no more, he says, Add not sins to those which you have committed already, but be careful to pray for the pardon of your past transgressions. Otherwise, if you commit another mortal sin, the gates of the divine mercy may be closed against you, and your soul may be lost forever. When then, beloved brethren, the devil tempts you again to yield to sin, say to yourself, If God pardons me no more, what shall become of me for all eternity? Should the devil in reply say, Fear not, God is merciful, answer him by saying, What certainty or probability have I that if I return again to sin, God will show me mercy or grant me pardon? O folly of sinners, if you purchase a house, You spare no pains to get all the securities necessary to guard against the loss of your money. If you take medicine, you are careful to assure yourself that it cannot injure you. If you pass over a river, you cautiously avoid all danger of falling into it. And for a transitory enjoyment, for the gratification of revenge, for a beastly pleasure which lasts but a moment, You risk your eternal salvation, saying, I will go to confession after I commit this sin. And when I ask, are you to go to confession? You say, on tomorrow. But who promises you tomorrow? Who assures you that you shall have time for confession and that God will not deprive you of life as he has deprived so many others in the act of sin. Would you, for such transient enjoyments, risk your money, your honor, your possessions, your liberty, and your life? No, you would not. How then does it happen that for a miserable gratification you lose your soul, heaven, and God? You have sinned trusting rashly in the divine mercy. The punishment of your guilt shall fall suddenly upon you, and you shall not know from whence it comes. What do you say? What resolution do you make? If after this sermon you do not firmly resolve to give yourself to God, I weep over you and regard you as lost. Thus far, St. Alphonsus. Let us not, then, be so hard-hearted and reprobate. Let us earnestly seek forgiveness from our good God. Let us not abuse his great mercy. Let us be bold in applying the remedy for our habits, not bold in sinning, as we may have been in the past. Let us beg our Blessed Mother that she aid us, that she strengthen our good resolutions. When the devil comes to tempt you to sin again, to presume vainly upon God's mercy, call to Mary, Mother of Mercy, comfort of sinners, who will not fail to help us if we truly desire her aid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.